Hello and welcome to another time of Bible teaching. We're in the book of Revelation chapter 10 today, and that is the mighty angel with the whittle book. Um, and this is a, a chapter of Revelation I really never dug into much or paid much attention to because it's sealed up and he said, don't tell them about it. But there's actually a lot there. Oh my goodness, it's actually really cool when you understand it uh, now that I do now. Um, before we get started, I want to do a little recap of where we are in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is considered to be apocalyptic literature. And it's not like in the movie Apocalypse Now. Apocalypse, apocalyptic means to reveal, to unveil, to make known. That's where the word revelation to reveal comes from. Okay. So it's a roadmap to the end times. But you need the key because apocalyptic literature is written in signs and symbols in pictures. And, and the key is the rest of the Bible. You have to understand what John is being revealing to us here and how it relates elsewhere to Scripture. Unfortunately, many people just see something and they take something out of the world and say, that's got to be it. And it leads to a lot of error and understanding. Okay. Um, so in Revelation 1, um, in verse 19, John is told to write the things which you have seen, that's chapter one, the things which are, this is 90 AD-ish, somewhere in that ballpark, that's the church age, that's chapters two and three, which is for all the churches. It's interesting because each letter is written to an individual churches, a church, but it says, let the churches hear. <laughs> Each of those letters to the churches also says, he who has an ear, let them hear. Everybody's got ears. It's for everyone. But what's also interesting, <coughs> my apologies, um, also in scripture, you'll see the phrase, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. That means somebody that's filled with the Holy Spirit, who's actively discerning what's going on, because a lot of people can hear things and not hear things, if you know what I mean. And it says, and then the things that take place after this, that's Revelation 4 on, which is the rapture, tribulation, and the millennial kingdom. Okay, so rapture, when you look at uh, Revelation 4, 1, that's the rapture. But what is it for? What is the first thing it says? After these things, after the church age. Okay, and Revelation 4 and Revelation 5 show you what's going on in heaven after the church age. Revelation 6, you, you come to the earth and you're seeing what's going on on earth after the, after the, <clears throat> the, the rapture, after the church age. And you see the seven seals. Actually, no, we only see six seals. And then we have a break, a parenthesis. Okay, and you're going to have several of these parentheses or breaks in the flow of time because it's pretty much written in, in chronological order, but there's a lot of breaks because if you had gotten everything dumped on you that's going on at one given time, it would be confusing and it would be hard to understand. So this is the way God chose to set it up. Uh, but you only see six seals here. Why? The seventh seal is in chapter eight with the trumpet judgments, because the, the seven trumpet judgments come out of the seventh seal. That's how you know they're in order. And just as the seven bowl judgments come out of the seventh trumpet judgment. So uh, Revelation 7 is about the 144,000 that are sealed. How does it start? After these things, after the church age. Um, these have a seven-year ministry, these 144,000, and we, we did a teaching on that. What's interesting, though, is the if you look in Matthew 24 from verses, I guess, um, 4 to 13, you can draw a parallel to those with the seal judgments. And we did that when we studied um, the seal judgments. And then in 14, it says, And the gospel of kingdom will be preached in all of the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. 
that word end is telos, not teleos. So telos means goal. You can scratch out end and write goal. What's the goal? To bring in the millennial kingdom when Yeshua is reigning here from the throne in Israel. That's the goal. <laughs> so we see that we saw in Revelation that they started their ministry at the beginning at the rapture after the church age. And here we see that they're in, in this, they end their ministry at the end. They have a seven year ministry at the goal, the beginning of the church age. You know, a lot of people, it's, you know, you have organizations out there that are trying to put the Bible into, into every language of the world so that they can take the gospel to the entire world. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not man's job. That's the 144,000 that will be doing that. So in, in chapter 8, we came back to the trumpet judgments. Notice, um, where was it? Uh, verse 6 of chapter 8, it says, So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So they're all preparing to sound at the same time. These happened very quickly. <laughs> at the end of the trumpet, at the end of the seal judgments, we are most of our way through the first half of tribulation. Uh, my guess is we're somewhere around six months beforehand, and I have reason to say that. The great earthquake, you have a great earthquake in Ezekiel 38, 39, Gog and Magog, and that happens probably about 30, excuse me, about 30 days or six months before the midpoint of tribulation. That the Gog and Magog coming after Israel is what's going to wake Israel up and saying, oh my goodness, look at all that. Um, what are we supposed to say again? That's right. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Not all of them do. Only one third get saved. Um, and if you look, and we did look at Gog and Magog, it says in there in that day multiple times. So that happens during the last thousand years, starting with the rapture and tribulation. We also saw that who is the victor in that world war? It's not Israel. It is God. God's not going to step in until Israel comes to repentance. Um, anyhow, then we looked at the trumpet judgments. Last week, and notice that how many of them did we look at? Seven? No, six. We haven't seen the seventh trumpet judgment yet. We'll get that later. Now we're in chapter 10. Chapter 10 through uh, chapter 11, uh, 14 is another parenthesis, a break in time. It is still going on, but this is something that's happening throughout the course. It has a different timeline or it's something more general and it's not something that can put be put on the um, the timeline with the 21 judgments, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowl judgments, okay? So I think that gets catches us up to date. And so let's go ahead and start it. Verse 1, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. And a face was like the sun, and, it, and his feet were like pillars of fire. There's actually a lot in here. The first question is, who is this mighty angel? I'm going to give away what I think. I believe it's Yeshua. I believe it's Jesus Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah. And I'll explain why, but it doesn't mean that I'm right. It could be another angel that looks like him, that's acting like him. But let's look at these things. Clothed, uh, clothed with the clouds. What does that mean? Well, for now, let's just say that's like heavenly clothing. It's white. Um, but it's definitely not a man. It has a rainbow on his head. Hmm. Does that sound familiar somewhere? Let's go back to Revelation 4.3. Um Revelation 4, 3. And he who sat there, that's Yeshua, was like a jasper and a sardis stone. And that's the first and the last. Jesus is the first and the last, but the first and the last stones on the high priest um, breastplate. In, uh, in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throat in appearance like an emerald. Okay, and we also know that rainbow goes back to the um, Noah and the covenant with Noah that he would never destroy the earth again with water. He'll do it with fire, but not with water. Um, 
face like the sun. Have we heard that before? Yes. Let's look at Revelation 1.16, where we see a description of our Messiah. Revelation 1.16, in his right hand he had seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So that's what he looked like. He looked like the sun shining in his strength. Where else do we see that Jesus looking like this? Ah, you got it. The transfiguration. Let's go back to Matthew 17, but we're going to start the last verse of Matthew 16 to give a little context. A lot of people confuse, get a little confusion over this. Um, I wonder if it's Mark. Matthew, the last verse of Matthew 16, and this is what trips up a lot of preterists. A preterist, somebody who believes that all prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some here that shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. Hmm. Interesting. So the coming in his glory is the millennial, is the reign or when he comes back to the earth. So they're saying, see that it had to have happened before these people died. Well, not necessarily. As we, as we read through this account the, for the next, for the first 13 verses in Revelation 17, skip down to number nine. Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. So they saw it. It's not that it actually happened. They saw this vision. They saw the two witnesses. But um, And we're, we're going to get into more about these two witnesses when we actually get to the two witnesses. And it's actually cool because we see them right here. And we'll, we'll look at that one when we get there. But notice how um, in verse 2, his face shone like the sun. And his clothes became as, as white as the light. I really think this is Revelation 10. I believe this is Yeshua that we're seeing here in Revelation 10. Um, yeah, we're not going to go into that. So let's keep going. Back to uh, Revelation 10, chapter 1. His face shone like the sun, and his feet were like pillars. All right, I want you to do me a favor. Take a break, maybe pause, look at your feet. Now, I got big feet. I got size 13s. I'm glad they're not 14s. I can still buy shoes in a normal shoe store. But do your feet look like pillars? No, they don't. This is one of the reasons you know that the book of Revelation was written in Hebrew. Because in Hebrew, the word for feet starts from the knee down just like the word for hands starts from the elbow down. Now we know that the nails for the crucifixion went to his feet and hands, probably not in the feet and hands, but it was probably more um, in the lower leg and in the wrist, because if a, if a nail was put here and you're hanging from it, it's eventually going to pull out. It's going to stay in here. Okay, so this is one of the ways. When, they, when the book of Revelation was translated from... Hebrew to Greek, there were two different words they could have chose. They chose the ones for hand and feet. You don't have feet that look like pillars. All right. Um, give me a second here. Let's go to verse two. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Prophetically, when you see sea and land, it's not, you would, you know, you think the ocean, the water, and the shore. That's not what it means. The land is Israel. The sea represents the Gentile nations. Okay. But when it says his foot, what is the significance of his foot? The feet show ownership. So he's right here, he's saying, I'm taking it back. It all belongs to me. And that's the topic here. This is Yeshua claiming that he's just going to take it all back right here, right now. But it's not happening right here, right now, but he's proclaiming it. 
Um, I don't know the Hebrew. We can't see the Hebrew words. We don't have the Hebrew text to this. In Hebrew, the um, a lot of the words get the ver I believe it's the verbs get really interesting because they have different tenses. Yeah, the verbs get really tense. Some of the stuff in Hebrew, when you look at it, the commands are permanent commands. Some are temporary, and some are what's called a prophetic per perfect tense, which means you're saying it as if it's already happened, even though it hasn't. But it's so sure that it's going to happen, you say it like it's already happened. Now, you cannot see this in the English. If you, even if you had Hebrew, a Hebrew text, it's hard to see. You, you really, and I've talked to some of my customers who are Orthodox Jews, and they said, yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I can't see it. I don't know how to look for that. Um, the person who I learned from, who I studied from, is an expert in Hebrew. He teaches advanced Hebrew. So, so how do I, what does that mean when I say it, that foot shows ownership? Go to Deuteronomy 11, verse 24. Deuteronomy 11, verse 24. Oh, that's 12. No wonder it didn't look right. Every place on which the soles of your feet tread shall be yours from the wilderness and the Lebanon, um, from the river and the river Euphrates, even to the Western Sea shall be your territory. Ooh, has Israel had all that land yet? No, they will. When the millennial kingdom's here, they will, but they haven't had it yet. But wherever they tread, it will, will belong to them. That's what this is saying. Let's go and look at Joshua, verses 1. Now, keep in mind that Moses didn't, didn't go into the promised land. Why? He didn't follow directions. You know, when God tells you something, like you see all through Torah, that God says that he wants you to do, and you're like, oh, well, he really doesn't care about that. Ask Moses how serious God is about, about following directions. Um, Moses struck a rock to get water out twice. He wasn't supposed to. He was supposed to strike it once and then speak to it. So he didn't get to go into the promised land. So Joshua was the one taking over to go into the promised land. So let's look at Joshua 1. Verses, what, 1 and 2, or 2 and 3. We'll start in 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, actually, that's the son of Nun. It's not Nun. Joshua had parents. But notice this is a quote from God. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all the people to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. Every place that the soles of your foot tread upon, I have given to you, as I said to Moses. Let's look at one more place where we see this. Ezekiel 43 where it talks about this. As we're turning there, you can also think about the story with Ruth and Boaz. And when he proclaimed the land, he gave a shoe because it had the dirt from the land. That's the ownership. It also, it also translates to when Jesus sent out his disciples and he said, if they don't hear you, brust the, the dust off of your sandals. Um, and a lot of people I've heard teaching, oh, yeah, you had to brush that dust off. That'll weigh you down. It'll destroy your ministry. No, 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 no. That is a statement saying, this land does not belong to me. But Ezekiel 43, um, start in verse 2, behold the glory of God. Who is the glory of God? That's Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, our Messiah. The glory of God of Israel came by the way of the east, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. 
and the earth shone with his glory. So this is Christ coming back into the temple um, after he's come down from the Mount of Olives and you read about it in Zechariah and they split the land because there's a graveyard there. Uh, was it Solomon the Great or whatever, put a graveyard thinking no Jewish boy is going to like walk through this. So there's no problem. There's just being an earthquake, split the graveyard. Jesus walks right through. Um, skip down to verse 7. He, and he said to me, son of man, this is the place of my throne. This is where Jesus is going to sit as a king, my throne, and the place of the soles of my feet, ownership. That's what it's talking about. And I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. If you're not part of the children of Israel, you're not in the presence of Jesus when he's reigning on earth. The children of Israel from the very beginning was a mixed multitude, and we are part of that mixed multitude. Okay. Um, I just did a teaching on that not long ago. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail there because that would be a long rabbit trail. Okay, let's go back to Revelation 10. Okay, so, and he had a little book on his, on his hand. He set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and cried with a loud voice as a, when a roar, a lion roars, when he had carried out, when he had cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Okay, when does a lion roar? Does a, if a lion is out hunting, does it roar when it's like 30 yards away from its prey so the prey gets a fair chance to get away? No, 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 no. The lion sneaks up. He doesn't roar until after he's captured his prey, after he's conquered what he has come to conquer. All right. Um, give me a second here. Go to Revelation 5.5. 5. And again, think about the prophetic perfect. He's saying it as if it's already happened. We still got seven more seal judgments. Excuse me. We still have a trumpet judgment that contains seven more bowl judgments to go. It's not over yet. We still have the, basically the whole second half of tribulation to go. Revelation 5.5. 5. We could go many places to show this, but we'll go to Revelation 5.5. 5. And what do we have there? Ah. Oh, still not there. These pages are getting awful thin. Wearing them out. Um, but one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seals. Who is the lion? That's Jesus. That's Yeshua. That's why I really believe that this great angel is Yeshua. Um, the root of David, what does that mean? He came before David. Okay. Um, let's also go to one other place. And there's a lot of places we can go about Jesus and a lion. But let's go to Amos 3.4. right after Joel, Amos 3, 4. Will a lion roar in the forest when it has no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he has caught nothing? No, it won't. All right. Um, an interesting thought. This is something that um, the school of the Essenes taught. Um, you know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, these are the sects of Judaism of that day. The Way was a sect of Judaism back in that day. But there were the Essenes. This is a sect that said that recognized that the temple system was corrupt and they left it and they went and set up shop down near the Dead Sea. John the Baptist came out of the Essenes. OK, but they understood that there was two comings of Yeshua. 
the 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 Messiah ben Joseph and the Messiah ben David, the son of Joseph and the son of David. So when you said, oh, is this the son of David? You know, or when he was in his hometown, isn't this the son of Joseph? That's what they're talking about. Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben David. He came the first time as the suffering lamb and he's going to come back as the conquering king. All right, let's move on. Um, back in Revelation 10. All right, now the seven thunders uttered their voices. Da, da, da. Seal up. Okay, they said, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. Don't ask me what they wrote or what they said. I don't know. John did. But apparently it was important enough to John to hear them so he could understand what was going on. But he, they told us not to write it down. Or they told him not to write it down. It's interesting that he said that. Um, let's keep going. Now, when this, the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. Okay, so we just talked about that. Um, you know, it might be that it just gave us too much information and it would be too much to give away at that point. You never know just a guess. Let's look at five and six. The angel who I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and all things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, the sea and the things that are in it, and that there should be no delay no longer, that there should be delay no longer. All right, so if this is Yeshua, is he swearing to himself? Or who is he swearing to? Seriously, think about it. Um, let's go to John 1.1. 1, 1. You go to three verses here. John 1.1, 1, 1. this is pretty basic. Most of the people say, oh, I know where he's going with that. And you should. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Um, and in 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he dwelt, and he, I'm sorry, beheld his glory, and the glory of his begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, I should have gone one more verse. When we did one and two, we, we needed three as well. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. So this angel who's swearing to the ones that created everything is swearing to Yeshua, swearing to Jesus. Let's go to Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17. For by him, all things were created that are in the heavens and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Ooh, he created the invisible things too, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. And the things were created through him and for him. And it is before, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. <coughs> that word consist means like to hold together, so that he holds everything together. But the dominions, principalities, and powers. So He's, in, he's He created the demons. I mean, they fell, whatever. But you name it, he created it, period. Let's go one more place. Hebrews 6, verses 13 and 14. Hebrews 6. Verses 13 and 14. For when God made a promise to Abraham, but he could... He could swear by no one greater. He swore by himself, saying, Surely blessings I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. So yes, God does swear to himself. Jesus does swear to himself. Okay, back to Revelation 10, verse 7. But in the days of the surroundings of the seventh angel, when he was about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. 
and and he declared to his as he declared to his prophets the servants. So the seventh angel is about to sound, and that's going to bring about the seven trumpet judgments, which will finish up the twenty-one seal judgments. The mystery of God, mystery. You think Twilight Zone? Do, 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 do. Nope, that's not it. The mystery is a sowed. It is the deepest level of understanding scripture and Hebraic hermeneutics. Okay, these are the mysteries, the things that were hidden in scripture meant to come out another time. Um, we're going to get there or not? Yeah, we will. So let's go a few places, okay? And look at this. Um, the bottom line, we're looking at all this. Jesus is saying, it's happening. I'm taking it back soon. It's mine. Um, go to Mark 4, 11 and 12. Oh, Mark 4, 11 and 12. Ah, the purpose of parables. Okay, and Jesus is just basically at this point, Israel has corporately rejected Jesus. If they had accepted Jesus and repented, the millennial kingdom would have started right then and right there but they didn't. The unpardonable sin is Israel corporate really rejecting Jesus. And then Jesus starts talking in parables. In fact, he will never again speak to large crowds of people except for parables. So let's read uh, Matt, Mark 4, starting in verse 10. But when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you, it has been, been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who were outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing that they may hear and not understand. Least they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. They've already rejected them. It's too late. Um, it's, it's, I, I love this, but anyhow, and you'll see a lot of these parables are talking about, um, the kingdom of God is like, and he's talking about the millennial kingdom, which is something that really wasn't known a whole lot about at that point. Um, I mean, they have pictures in it. They have like Ezekiel 40 through 48, but Jesus gives them a lot more understanding. And so does Paul. Um, and a lot of the things that they understood, they understood scriptures, but they didn't get it. Okay. Think about the resurrection. Um, actually, we'll get there. Let's start with Amos 3 7. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go to Amos 3 7. Again, it's right after Hosea. And this is a verse that I've known for a long time, and I've misquoted this verse for a long time. I left one word out always. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. I would always say, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals it first to his servants and prophets. I left that word secrets out for years. That word secrets is so. The things hidden in Scripture, those mysteries hidden in Scripture that they didn't get. Um, I'm not going to go there, but I'll give you one example of this. Um, Isaiah 26, starting in verse 19, is the rapture. And it starts with, behold, your dead will rise from the dust. Like, and then it says, like, rejoice or uh, awake and sing. Awake and sing, your dead shall arise from the dust. Awake, awakening blast on Rosh Hashanah, sing. The, they're going to be singing a new song as soon as they're in heaven, everybody who's raptured. And then it says, go my people into your chambers and close the door behind you. 
people never, it doesn't say go my dead people. There are live people going into those chambers, those bridal chambers. Do you remember when uh, Lazarus was dead and Jesus actually waited some extra time to make sure he was good and dead? Past the three days that his body would be rotting already. Because it was understood that you know, after three days, the body starts to rot. That was the understanding. And Mary looked at him like, you know, if you would have been here, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. He says, well, he's going to rise. And, she, and Mary said, well, I know they're all going to rise on the last day. They got that. They didn't get the people rise before that. They didn't get the rapture. That's what Paul was talking about when he said, behold, I show you a mystery. With that said, let's go ahead and go there. We're going to go to 2 Thessalonians 2. Oh, no, we're not. Give me a second. Uh, we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians 2. Wait, wait, hold on. Okay, I misunderstood where my notes were taking me. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, okay? When I said 2 Thessalonians 2, I'm like, that ain't right. But I see where I'm supposed to be going after this. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. That's Rosh Hashanah, twinkling of an eye, is evening twilight. That's what, They're both idioms, Jewish idioms. But see, we shall not all sleep. They, sleep is used for only for people who die in righteousness, people that die, they're going to be saved. They're going to be brought back. He's saying, we're not going to all sleep. It's a mystery. It's something hidden in scripture beforehand. He's probably referring back to Isaiah 26. Now, so that verse, Amos 3, 7, God does nothing without telling his, his secrets to his servants and prophets first. If the law was going to be abolished. If all of the, if the Sabbath is going to be done away with, there would have been something in prophecy about it. Is there? Yeah, there is. Let's go look at it, okay? Daniel 7.25. He shall speak... Pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High. He shall intend to change the times, that's the appointed times, the feast days, and the law, Torah. <coughs> and the saints shall be given into his hands for time, times, and half a time. Wait a minute. <clears throat> I was taught that Jesus changed the times and the laws. This is not Jesus. This is the Antichrist. Why in the world would Jesus come to do something that the Antichrist, Satan, is um, described to do. That prophecy tells us that Satan and the Antichrist will do it. Why would Jesus do something they were supposed to do? Guess what? He would not. Go with me to um, 2 Thessalonians 2. And just show you something, and then we'll get back to Revelation. One more verse here. Second Thessalonians. Come on, Dave. All the T's are together. You'll find it. Here we go. Second Thessalonians 2. Um, verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is now is already at work, and he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. I believe that he there is the that that's restraining is the church. Um, so the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So when Paul wrote this, the lawlessness 
being the being without Torah, without law, either by choice or ignorance. That was already at work. The spirit of the Antichrist was already at work in the world. And a lot of that got a big push by Constantine. He may have been a saint, but he was not a good saint. Not at all. Oh, my goodness. All right. Let's go back to Revelation 10, look at 8 and 9, and we're going to be wrapping this up a little bit. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. They're making that sea and earth thing really prominent, that this is Jews and Gentiles. See, the division is not Jew and Gentile. The division is wheat and tear. Who tears? Who do you belong to? So I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take and eat it. Um, it will make your stomach bitter and it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Let's go ahead and read this out because there's not much left in our, in our Bible study here. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, <coughs> my stomach had become bitter. And he said to me, you must, prophesy, uh, you must prophesy again against many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So many people believe, and I saw something on Facebook, that uh, Revelation is where God gets even with the Jews. If that's the case, why does he have to prophesy to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings? No, many people, Jew and Gentile alike, are going to come to salvation during tribulation, multitudes upon multitudes. So what do we know? We don't know a lot about this little book, but it sounds weird that it's going to be sweet in our stomach or in our mouth, but bitter in our stomach. And people could make all kinds of wild guesses. But the question is, is this something from somewhere else in the Bible? Because, again, this is apocalyptic literature. Did this happen before? Yes, it did. So go with me to Ezekiel chapter 2. Yeah, a lot of these stories in the Old Testament, they're just picture stories of things that will happen again. Ezekiel 2, give me a second, I got some weird notes, I'm not understanding them. Okay, we're looking at Ezekiel 2.8 through chapter 3.11, so let's go ahead and read it, and then we're going to wrap up here. Um, Ezekiel 2, starting in verse 8, but you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. Well. That doesn't sound like it's a... a a, how do I put it, a feel-good book? No, not at all. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go. Speak to the house of Israel. So he opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with the scroll that I give you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. Then he said to me, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to the people of unfamiliar speech and hard languages, which words you cannot understand. Surely I have sent you to them. They would have listened to me. But the house of Israel will not listen, because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are imprudent and hard-hearted. Hard-hearted, what does that mean? Will not repent. Okay. 
but the house of Israel will not listen to you because that's right. Behold, verse eight, I have made your face strong against their faces and your forehead strong against their foreheads like adamant stone, harder than flint. I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, nor be dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, son of, of man, receive into your heart all the words that I speak to you and your ears and hear with your ears and go get the captives to the children of your people and speak to them and tell them, thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or whether they refuse. Um, so what is he speaking? God saying they're hard-headed, their hearts are hardened, they're not going to listen, but speak to them anyhow. What's the general message always? Repent, repent, and they're not going to do it. Um, the message is sweet to the taste because we see what's coming. We see the glory of the kingdom that's going to be coming. If they would repent, it would be good for them because repentance is meant to bring about restoration. Restoration is meant to bring about um, glorification. Real simple. There is no salvation without repentance. There's not. Um, if they would have repented, it would have been good for them. They did not. God knew that. So the message that he's talking is about the judgments to come. And that's what we see that John's saying. Let's go back to Revelation. Actually, I'm just going to wrap it up. But we, we're going about to blow in a little while. We're going to see the seventh trumpet blow, which has this, which has in it the seven bowl judgments, and they are vile. They are worse than what we've seen so far. So even though this the topic is the kingdom of heaven coming, which is sweetness, but they're going to have to go through a lot more bad stuff before they get there, and that cannot sit right in anybody's stomach. You know, with that said, if you're not saved, and I don't mean just, you know, you raise your hand one day at a, at a um, church service and they said, welcome to the family of God. If you're not repentant, saved, and living for God, you might want to start doing it. Um, tribulation is not the time to, to accept Christ. Do it now while you can, okay? And, and how do you know if you have? Go to 2 John, take the test if you know Jesus. And it talks about if you obey his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Um, the reason there's a highway to heaven, excuse me, a highway to hell and a stairway to heaven, you'll find that in, um, what is it? Uh, Matthew 7 is because of the false prophets. That includes teachers. You have so many teachers that don't talk about repentance, that you have to repent. You have to change your evil ways. You can't keep doing the evil stuff and expect to be in heaven. If you got questions, text me. We can talk. I've had many conversations with people who contacted me from here. Anyway, I thank you for listening. May God bless you, and we'll be back with more teaching soon. Thank you so much for following. Take care.